somebody somewhere borrows money for something and that money goes into the economy. It gets moved around, people buy and sell and whatever. And then sometimes one way of getting that money is not working for it. It's making a claim against it. Lawyers, that's what they do. They take money that they don't work for. They take money based on a claim. Makes sense, right? Well, if, as you've seen since the 50s in most states, the, 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 the legal system, if you want to call it that, has been managed by lawyers. And lawyers are members of a private membership association. The sole purpose, really, I mean, there's there's other there's things they're doing, okay, but the the purpose that that's affecting us is that this association, in connection with the court system, in fact, the court system, I would I would argue, is an administrative arm of the bar association, and part of its existence is to own the law and then ration it out based upon an agenda of people or organizations that you've never heard of and you never will. I call them foreign financial interests, okay? So that's where we have a problem. We're complaining about lawyers, but we hire them. And that's what's going on. They're not producing something, they're just taking property, taking it from one and giving it to another. And maybe there's a legitimate claim for that, okay? And I think in many cases, it's unfair. And so what I try to do is make, let's say level the playing field, if you will. So. <clears throat> the attorneys, and I'm talking about judges too, and your court system is the vehicle for this. The attorneys are the gatekeepers, or they want to be the gatekeepers of the law. The law is a <clears throat> just like the air. You shouldn't own it. <laughs> you can't own it. It's like the river that flows through your neighbor's property, then it flows through your property, then it flows through someone else's property. And the property before yours, somebody put up a dam, right? And it's restricting your use, or someone polluted it. And now you're getting not getting the water or you're getting a polluted version of the water. That's what's going on with your law, your law. Now, the reason why we have a court system, the reason why that even operates is because people have judicial power, but they can't be deciding matters all the time. They have to, they have to uh, appoint somebody or make someone an agent to administer these matters. We want that. We want a court system. Well, these guys, we've given them a monopoly over not the law, we gave them a monopoly, a very special one, over the police power. Think about it. Whenever you go to court, ultimately what you're trying to do is take a claim on property and make it to where you, you can legally go take the property. Money, mostly. And we want that. We don't want to have uh, duels at noon in, in the street, or, you know, or have violence and this sort of thing. So we have a court system in this, in this. but in, in, that, in that act, We've, we've created the monster, so to speak, but we have to realize what we've done and let's rein it back in a little bit. Okay. So that's, you know, I don't want to be philosophical here, but um, yeah, so really that's what I want to say. So let's just talk about, let's describe the type of property that when I say the word property, in my mind, I'm thinking property like an exclusive right to sell or to sell something. That's what I'm thinking. Property is an exclusive right to sell something, okay? That would be a property right. Another example of, there's different types of rights like property rights and fundamental rights. You have fundamental rights of, you know, just being a human being, you have fundamental rights, okay? Like for example, the right to due process, it might be a property right, but I would say the right to due process might be a fundamental right. The right to life might be a fundamental right that people have, right? That's recognized by our system of law, okay? And then, it's more specifically, and this is what I always talk about, is intangible property rights. This is what we're seeing being liquidated in family court. So people talk about, I lost my house, the wife got it in the divorce. Okay, you, you missed everything else because she also got something else. She probably got your private and tangible property rights, but she didn't get it or he didn't get it. The court took it from whomever and then reallocated, forced it somehow as if you never had the property right. That's what's going on because you don't understand what's going on. That's happening to you because you don't understand what's happening. You don't understand that child custody, parental custody is a property right. It's an intangible private property right. No one can get it. You can't even give it to somebody. You can, you can fabricate a situation like an adoption, 
no problem there. We recognize that. And that's great if you want to be, you know, an adoptive parent. That's fantastic. But you then have private property rights, intangible private property rights. So money is a claim. And uh, the claim, the best you can do with it is to transfer it. That's all really what you're doing, okay? Almost everything you're doing has to do with transferring the liability. I mean, look at it this way. When you guys call me up and have me set up an LLC for you, what I'm showing you how to do is get indemnification from the state for a mere filing fee. And then I'm charging you money for a consulting for the year because there's a lot more to it than just that, right? Most people, they set up an LLC and they use it for crypto accounts. And then they just, it's like buying a helicopter to uh, take it to work every Monday, every 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 weekday. Why? The, you're getting a helicopter to, to, to take it to work when you could just take a skateboard or drive, okay? There's a lot more you can do with your LLC. I'll give you an example. You can uh, simply acquire a, some sort of cash flow with it. It can be, you can get a, a lease agreement, okay? That you're leasing out to somebody. You can, you can be the assignee of a promissory note. You can be the assignee, your company can be the assignee of a, 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 a tax deed, right? Just anything that was is going to create some cash flow. Let's say you created two thousand dollars a month for your LLC cash flow. Okay, here's so power. Here's such powerful information. If your LLC has regular cash flow and it has a value, let's say it has ten thousand dollars in the bank, okay, and it has regular cash flow, not even two thousand a month, but let's just say that number, that's really valuable for getting financing. And I could take that balance sheet, okay, and that's what you do. You get a balance sheet on your company. And you use that as leverage to go buy something else with other people's money. Now you're really using the LLC for what it is intended. It's to it's to make it's a, to allow you to increase your net worth and manage the risk quite effectively. You're using the state to get indemnification. How are you getting that? Well, what what happens is the state says we're going to protect the owners of the company against personal liability as long as they're operating in the purview of the corporation or the LLC or whatever it is. Okay, they're not dealing drugs or something like that, something illegal. The state is going to allow the owners of the company to separate their personal interest from the company. So that way, if a claim is made against the company, the claimant, the creditor, can't reach into the company and take the property of the individual owners. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to do any investments, would it? If everybody's personally liable for everything, that's not fair. You couldn't get anything done. You see what you're getting? It's property rights. And people criticize me and they say, but John, the LLC is a statutory creature. Oh, of course it is. I want that. Because it's just like, I want a lawnmower to cut my grass. I don't want some sheep to cut my grass. Right? I'll get a fine from the HOA, <laughs> as, it, as it were. <laughs> so I want a lawnmower. Well, if I use a lawnmower, it doesn't make me a lawnmower. I'm using a tool that was designed for the purpose for which I'm using it to indemnify myself and my activities. So that way I don't look like a fool. Okay. So we have all these tools, guys. We have all these tools. When I say guys, I don't exclude women, guys and girls. We have all these tools and uh, I talk about them all the time and, you know, getting into the next uh, group. All right. So, you know, the tax situation, you guys understand there's some basic concepts there. The thing that's taxed, the thing that's being taxed, you should be able to pay the tax in that thing. You got to think about this. How can you tax this pen? Can you see it? I'm just grabbing something off my desk. How do you tax this pen? First of all, it has to be sold, right? Then there's a sales tax. Well, it's sold for what? Taxable currency. The currency is taxable. This is so true in every jurisdiction. We just miss it. I can't understand why CPAs get this wrong. Same with cryptos, okay? Cryptos are defined as property. Thank you very much, IRS, for doing the right thing. Gold is property. So what did defining cryptos as property do for cryptos? It brought in 100 years of case law, and I say 100 years because I'm going back to the beginning of the economic system that's gone through several iterations, cycles, 2013, okay? Let's just go back to that. I'm sorry, 1913, 100 years ago, okay, roughly. All right, and all the case law from that period of time until now protects you when you have property. 
I'm talking about not real estate. I'm talking about, you know, chattels, gold, you know, precious metal, uh, stock, things like that. Okay. 